right, let's just bring you up to speed with some developments at West Ham and it concerns Roberto. He has uh, left West Ham to join the La Liga side uh, Deportivo Alaves on loan until the end of the season. He's a 33-year-old goalkeeper, of course. He's under contract at West Ham until 2021. Uh, and this comes after he's made 10 appearances for West Ham in all competitions so far. Uh, he joins the team. Alaves are sitting 14th in La Liga uh, following a 1-0 win at Levante at the weekend and he could actually make his debut at home to Villarreal on Saturday evening. Uh, West Ham, they just end their statement about Roberto saying that they wish him all the best for his loan spell in La Liga. Right, you might have noticed that a number of our transfer team have been on the road throughout the day. Alice Piper is one of them. She's been speaking to Ralph Hattenhuto this morning and Alice, just bring us up to date. What's he had to say? Hi Joe, good afternoon. Now don't be fooled by the sunshine here at Southampton's training ground. It is absolutely freezing but thankfully it was much warmer in the press office and that's where I've been speaking to Southampton manager Ralph Houghton-Hootel. Now they had a disappointing result at the weekend didn't they? They were leading by two goals to nil with Wolves. They went on to lose that game 3-2 but that can't take away from the fact that they want a really impressive run at the minute. They've won six of their last ten Premier League games and Ralph Hasenhutl actually recently said he feels that's taken the pressure off needing to add reinforcements during this January transfer window. He has though admitted he is still in the market for fullbacks. We know that Kyle Walker-Peters has been of interest. Obviously Joe Bryan as well is a name heavily linked here as well. So I asked him what really is the state of play at the minute with January transfers and he said it's difficult to, to think of bringing players in on loan in January without the option to buy. Just have a listen to this. If you sign a player and he he is not really used to the philosophy we play, I think it takes mostly one to two months until he's on that level like our players are. And, and as you know, we have three more months to go now and of, uh, until the end. And, and it it's really it really doesn't make sense to loan somebody until the end of the season and then he's going without the option for us to buy. So, uh, and the rest about buying immediately in the winter is not so easy. So this makes it very difficult. But uh, when we find a package that fits to us, where we have also an option to, to buy this guy in the summer, then it makes sense and uh, we are looking. So the club have obviously been climbing up the Premier League table, 13th in the table now. Interesting though, I said to him, would he be interested in bringing players in on loan? He said now, with the interest in numbers of players, could with how well the club are doing at the minute, could potentially bringing in players influence the flow of the dressing room? And he said, actually, it depends how many we were to bring in. If we were to bring in three or four players, then yes, it could do. If it was only one or two additions, then not really. And I couldn't end by asking him, not asking him, in fact, about Danny Ings as well. Obviously, 14 goals in the league so far this season, incredible form. And with the new News that Marcus Rashford could be out for the remainder of the season or for a couple of months at least. Could he be Gareth Southgate's answer with the upcoming Euros? He said it's probably a little bit too early to say, but he did praise Danny Ings because how can you not at the moment? Alice, great stuff. Thank you very much. Stay warm now. Well, perfectly warm here and uh, delighted to be joined back on the Skypad here by Stephen Presley. Stephen, I want to talk about this man here, James Madison. Now, it is the same man. I, I, I have to do a double take. He, he's... He's still a good-looking lad, but the hair's a little bit different. Um, you know him well from your Covent, uh, days at Coventry. What, what was he like? Well, oh, from the moment that I, I first watched James, I knew we had a terrific player on our hands. Of that, there was no doubt. He was an amazing talent. He, uh, you know, for one so young, he had the ability to control the speed of the game. He knew when to speed the game up. He knew when to, to take the sting out of the game. It was a, a, a really special um, attribute that he had. And, um, you know, from my perspective, I was never going to improve him as a technical player. But the one thing that I had to do was try and shape him as a character. And I was on him all the time about his jobs, about cleaning the boots, about uh, cleaning the balls, the dressing rooms, you know, doing what it takes to be a real professional football player. And also, you know, shaping him out of possession, which was a big responsibility, and making him understand that to be a top player playing in the top clubs these days, not only do you have a big responsibility in possession, but out of possession. And that was my real responsibility as manager. The other parts of it he had, it was shaping him and making him a really good professional. And did you see back then and think, this boy could go to the top? Without doubt. 
even from his first ever training session with our first team at 16 years of age, he went in there and there was no inferiority complex at all. He has this air of confidence, not arrogance, but confidence where he knows he can play at the very top. And uh, I think that that's a really important aspect of his, his makeup. That's why, you know, when people are talking just now about James moving to the likes of Manchester United, I would have no fears about him playing in that type of environment with those types of pressures because he thrives on that, the kid. He has a genuine belief about himself and, uh, you know, I think he's a really special player. Was there interest in Madison when you were at Coventry? Because obviously we went on to play for Norwich, etc. Yeah, there was interest almost immediately, mm -hmm. you know, in James. Um, you know, there was a lot of clubs monitoring the situation and, in fact, when it came to the, the, his first January window after his period in the, in the team, there was a number of clubs ready to strike on him, but he got, a, I think it was an ankle injury in that January, which set him back a little bit and probably knocked back those bids and coming in. But, you know, I had no doubt that this kid could go on and be a special player. And also, I think it's important to say that I think he's worked under the right managers in helping him develop. He worked under Alex Neal, who's a very demanding manager. He's worked under uh, Falke at, the, at uh, Norwich, who again is very demanding. And now he's working under, you know, Brendan, who, who as well is a demanding. So I think his pathway to where he's been has been very good. And uh, I think he'll only get better. Yeah, by going through that, he sort of con continues to improve year after year. So my next question was, can you see him getting even better? I can, you know, I can. You know, he's a, a special player. He'll work all the time on his, uh, on his attributes after training. You know, he always stayed behind and worked on his free kicks and those types of things. So he'll continue, continue to improve on that. But, uh, you know, I'm delighted to see him flourishing the way he has. And, uh, you know, as I've said, you know, he, we could always see he was going to be a special player. I remember in one of his early games and playing for the, the under-23s when we went to Queen's Park Rangers and played down there, and Harry Redknapp stopped me on the stairs coming down and asked me, who is your number 10? And of course it was James. <laughs> yes. It was James. Now, Leicester fans, don't worry, because he, he, you will probably be playing in the Champions League next season the way it's going. So I, I want to know as well, he could be playing in the Champions League for Leicester next season. Obviously, he'll be looking at all the biggest clubs around the world. But Leicester, he will be playing at the very top. How will he get on in the Champions League, playing against the very best week in, week out? No problem. You know, whatever the level, whatever the challenge, you know, he's, uh, he's embraced that. So, you know, I think he's a top-class midfield player. You know, he's got that ability to make the pass, make the moment. And, uh, you know... That's the type of stage that I think James feels he wants to play on. So I think that that will be an important factor in Leicester keeping him. And in, at this stage, you know, they're in pole position in terms of uh, themselves and potential suitors like Manchester United. So I hope for Leicester's sake, if they can cement that uh, all-important Champions League spot, then, you know, hopefully they can keep a hold of the likes of James. Absolutely. Do you still keep in touch? I do, actually, yes, I do. You know, I exchanged messages with him a couple of months ago because it was on a certain date that he made his debut for the club and he sent me a nice text. So, yeah, I do. And he gets his hair cut just round the corner from where I live, actually. No, so, that, yeah, answers it. that answers it. He yeah. does. He I, mean, I like it. It's a good, yeah. it's a good haircut. <laughs> Stephen, for now, thank you very thank much. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we've got plenty more to come from Stephen, so stay with us and don't forget to use that hashtag transfer talk. Next up, our focus will turn to Watford, Callum Wilson and John Fleck. Welcome back to Transfer Talk. Let's get straight to Sheffield United. They've been pretty quiet recently, but will there be any incomings? Well, we can now confirm that. Sheffield United are hoping to make a permanent signing before the end of today. Here is their manager, Chris Wilder. I believe we'll, we'll get um, one or two definitely in, in, the, in, in, in the next week. But the, <clears throat> it's always, Tim, as we all know, a moving market. Um, in terms of you know players players coming in and uh, and you know I can't I can't sit here and say that any of my players might uh, might not move on as well you know and ones that maybe we don't want to move on um, that's just how football is. Well, could one of those new signings already be in the building? Well, Chris Basham may have just given a few things away. 
that's the, one of the most important things. I just spoke with, uh, well, could be a new signing downstairs, so I just spoke to him and I just say, like, the best thing about it is having somebody who, uh, having a team around you, and that's how we've done so well over the last few years. Yeah, so Basham uh, giving a little bit away in that he's uh, perhaps met the new signing, and Keith Downey, you've got a little bit more information for yeah, us. Yeah, we heard uh, Chris Basham giving half a story there. We, all, we always hate half a story, don't we? <laughs> who? Just tell us who. Yeah, so I can, I can tell you now, um, it's our understanding, or it's my understanding, that it's um, Nottingham Forest left-back Jack Robinson. He's the man that's currently undergoing a medical at Sheffield United right now. They hope to have that one confirmed later on that day. So Chris Wilder, again, dropping back down into the Championship to, to bring a player up to play in the Premier League. So Basham, thanks very much for information. We've managed to, <laughs> we think, I hope I'm right now, Jack Robinson, uh, left back from Nottingham Forest, soon to be a Sheffield United player. Yeah, Detective Keith on the case. Uh, <laughs> right, let's get to Watford now. We've seen Ignacio Pacetto come in, but will there be more? Well, here are the thoughts of the Watford boss, Nigel Pearson. I don't rule anything out, but as I, I just reiterate what I said at the weekend, and that is that, that uh, I'm pretty happy with what we already have, and, and I don't... I'm not going to suggest that uh, there won't be any business, but uh, if if nothing happened here on in, I'm, I'm really pleased with the players that I currently have and we have available for us. I think what is important is that it's about trying to improve the squad. Um, it's not necessarily about freshening it up. And OK, let's go back to more players who are already talked about in the January window at Stephen knows very well. Let's start with Callum Wilson. Stephen, I know you're a big fan of Callum Wilson, but his career could have been completely different, couldn't it? Yeah. When I arrived at uh, Coventry, you know, he wasn't featuring within the first team. You know, and I, I recall my first day in charge there, you know, after the training with the, the first team squad, along with my assistant, I went over to watch the, the remainder of the, the reserves training and, and Callum was in there. Unfortunately enough for Callum that day, he had a terrific session and made a big impression on me. So from that day onwards, we brought him into the, the first team group. There was three or four months remaining of the season when I arrived. He, he wasn't outstanding, but did enough to convince us that uh, we could have something here. Then the following season, he linked up with Leon Clark and made a formidable partnership. And, the rest is history, you know, he's, he's gone on to have a terrific career, but he deserves great credit because I think he's a player that's maximised his career. You know, he's a, a really special kid, a great character, and um, he's had some big setbacks in his career through injury, and he's overcame them and continued to perform at the highest level. What's it like as a manager when you get a partnership, and especially in pre-season, you see Callum there, and then Leon Clark, you think, wow, I can't wait for the season to start. Yeah, I think that when you go into a club, we all have preconceived ideas of how we want our team to play. You know, my preferred system is a 4-3-3 system, but sometimes you have to adapt your system to suit your best players. So we adopted a 4-4-2 system that year, you know, and Callum uh, being the one that liked to stretch the game, and Leon Clark is a player that I would describe as a 9-10 that plays in the 9 position, but is equally... Um, as efficient uh, in terms of linking the game. So it was a really, really good partnership and uh, they scored so many goals together. And we, that season, went from minus 10 points to the verge of uh, the playoffs come January. And a lot of it was about around those two players. And you're saying off air, what a lovely guy he is. And you gave me a really good story. And I want, I want to share it with the viewers as well, yeah. a story you were saying to me. Yeah, obviously Callum, as I said there, has had some uh, real setbacks in his career through injury. He's had, you know, several uh, cruciate knee injuries and, uh, you know, he's overcame them and not over just overcome them. He's, uh, he's managed to play back at the top level. And when I was at um, Carlisle, we had a young player, Josh Dixon, who's a, a really good young talent. And he just returned in the pre-season there from his own uh, setback in terms of a, a cruciate knee injury. And during the pre-season, after making a big impression on me, he again uh, had a second cruciate injury, mm. which was real devastating for not just him, but for his family. And on the back of that, I spoke to Callum, and Callum sent the kid a really lovely you know, video message, which uh, 
you know, I, I, I think, you know, really help to, to uplift the, the kids' spirits. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, he's often linked with clubs in and around the top six, I mean, Chelsea and Tottenham in particular over the last few years. Could you see him playing for a club in the top six in, in the future? Well, I can. The one thing that Callum possesses that can disturb any defence is blistering speed. And that's the thing with him. You know, technically, he can uh, certainly improve. You know, I think he has improved under the stewardship of Eddie Howe. But that blister and speed and movement will disturb any defender. So, you know, that's why I can always see him playing at the very top. Yeah. Right, let's Callum Wilson then. Fantastic. Though. Let's go on to John Fleck, another player you know really well. What a weekend he had. <laughs> How many kits of Coventry had? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> now, let's start on John Fleck. Tell us about him. You scored, obviously, on Saturday and you have spoken to him. Well, I've not spoken to him, exchanged messages with a little man yeah, on, on, yeah. On, uh, on Saturday night because yeah. I'm delighted to see him doing so well. He's an amazing character. Um, during my two years in charge at Coventry, he was probably my most consistent performer. Mm. You know, he's a little bit of a throwback. He would play football in the, the local park if he could. But uh, it's amazing to see him progress. A little bit like a lot of the Sheffield players where they went when they went from League One to the to the championship, many people, uh, you know, predicted that many of the players couldn't make that step up. But not only have the players stepped up to the championship, they've made the step up to the Premier League. And during this time, I remember speaking to Gordon Strachan on John because I rated him extremely highly, and I said to Gordon that he's certainly one that, you know, should monitor. When I, when I arrived at Coventry again, he was a player that wasn't featuring every week. He was a player that. Uh, you know, was seen as a number 10 or a wide player coming in off the side. And immediately, that's not where I've seen him play. Mm. I've seen him play more as a, as a balanced midfield player and breaking from the middle of the pitch. And from that position, he really prospered. And uh, I am. I'm really proud to see him perform in the Premier League in the manner that he is. It's been quite a career, hasn't it, for John Fleck? Starting at Rangers, actually tough, a youngster in Glasgow, but then in the lower leagues, working his way up, now in the Premier League. Could you see him playing for other clubs as well, maybe high, high, even bigger clubs as well? Yeah, I could. I think he's been a, a very underestimated player. You know, certainly not in his time in Glasgow. Mm. You know, when he first broke into the Rangers team, he was seen as the next big thing. But I think that uh, being in and around and staying in Glasgow, you know, hindered him to a certain degree with those expectations. But I think coming down to England, playing in the lower leagues, developing as a player and really finding you know, your position and, and your way of playing has, has helped him. And, of course, he's playing for a terrific manager in Wilder who's really getting the best out of him. And I think from my own experience of coaching John, he'll enjoy Chris's types of demands because he's a player that trains in a certain way every day, wants to win every day, demands every day, and that's certainly the type of manager that Chris is. So you can see why he has prospered under his management. Brilliant. I'm looking forward to talking to you about some gems in the EFL in the next part. If you make your way back there, I haven't got a seat today, but yeah, well, I'll see you in a few minutes. <laughs> We've got a little coffee waiting for you, because we, you. we love hearing uh, all these stories. Another player that you know well is Jared Branthwaite. We actually yes. spoke to you on the phone last week about him when he signed for Everton. Uh, you referred to him as a baby giraffe at one point, yes. which we loved. <laughs> um, just tell us a little bit more about the player, the person, and how much of a success you expect him to be. Well, in terms of the player, you know, once I'd uh, signed there and I was in the, the hot seat for a couple of days, I, I took the opportunity to go and watch the reserve squad playing at Oldham, and Jared performed that day. He was actually a midfield player that, that had been converted into a centre-back, but he made an immediate impression on me. From the moment that I seen him, I thought, wow, we've got a special player here. And I contacted David Holdsworth after watching him and said, we need to get this player tied up immediately, which we did so within two or three days with his parents in and signed the contract. And from that moment on, he trained with the first team. But the important thing was he had a lot of the attributes, but because he wasn't a natural defender, we spent a lot of time, you know, myself, Gavin Skelton, my coaches, in the afternoons working with the younger players like him. And we did a lot of defensive work, a lot of work on basics of the game, his heading, his, uh, his uh, defending on one-to-one -one situations. And slowly but surely, we've seen him progress. And he's a player that, in my opinion, with all his attributes, could eventually go on and play for England. Yeah.
the baby giraffe developing yes, into a big is. giraffe. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Excellent. Stephen, we love your tales. Uh, yeah. We've got plenty more to talk to uh, with Stephen, so stay with us and make sure you uh, download the latest episode of the Transfer Talk podcast. Lots of debate on there. It's via iTunes, Speaker and the Sky Sports website. But next, we will delve a little deeper and find out exactly what it's like to be a manager in the transfer window. You're watching Transfer Talk. Lots of you getting in touch using that hashtag Transfer Talk. Josh has just tweeted saying, Will Newcastle make any signings at all in this window? We need cover for all injuries, surely. And Keith, we've got a development, some breaking news. Josh, we can answer your questions. Um, Newcastle, we can tell you this is uh, breaking. Nabil Bentaleb, central midfielder, of course, you remember him uh, playing so well with Tottenham Hotspur, currently with Schalke in Germany. I can tell you he's currently uh, on Tyneside, set to to undergo a medical with Newcastle United over a loan deal uh, until the end of the season. So keen to get some game time in his legs. Steve Bruce, desperate to bring in players. We've been saying now for two weeks, wants to bring in a striker, a winger and a central midfielder. That looks like the central midfielder that Steve Bruce wants to bring. So Nabil Bentaleb, former Spurs midfielder, currently on Tyneside. Uh, we'll have a medical later on today. And Newcastle hope to announce this one before the day is out. OK, Newcastle fans, stand by. Keith, thank you. Now, it's a busy time, not only for the Premier League clubs, but for sides in the EFL and the SPFL. Stephen, you've been watching a lot of football the last few weeks, particularly in Leagues 1 and 2, and one football club in particular. Yeah, you know, a club that uh, has always had a great reputation for bringing through their young players, and that is Crew, and they're doing extremely well under the stewardship of David Artel. You know, he's been in the job now three years, and year after year, we've seen steady improvements, and that's because they, they field young players very quickly, but it takes time for them to develop and mature, and this season, we're really seeing them beginning to fulfil their potential. What's it like for a manager in the AFL? You've probably got a game on a Tuesday night or a Wednesday night and you're looking to bring a couple in. I mean, how many times do you have to charge your phone? It's very difficult, <laughs> you know, because we, we have a, a lot of, you know, various um, aspects about it. You know, for example, when I was at Carlisle, there, there's a number of stumbling blocks. One, it was a club with a low-end budget, you know, possibly a, a bottom four budget. But it's also a club where the geography makes life very difficult to attract yeah. players. So you, you, there's always these sort of things. And I think Newcastle's a side that are faced with that a little bit. You know, where they sometimes have to pay over the odds for certain players because of the geography of the club. Mm. Anyone looking to go to Newcastle, it's a brilliant, play, brilliant night out, <laughs> trust me. Um, finally, on players coming out, yeah. you talk about how you had such a great partnership with Leon Clark and Callum Wilson. Yeah. What's it like when you get a call, one of your players, We've accepted a bid for one of your players. How frustrating is that when you're trying to build a side? Well, it's very difficult. You know, I think if I go back to that particular period, we start the season playing out in Northampton, minus 10 points. Mm -hmm. And by the time it came to January, we were on the, the verge of the playoffs. Mm -hmm. And Callum and uh, Leon played a pivotal part in that. But in January, I lost uh, Callum Wilson to injury. Mm -hmm. And then, obviously, because of the financial restraints of Coventry at the time, we were under pressure to sell players. And we received an offer for um, Leon Clark, which we had to accept. And at that time, Leon moved to, to uh, Wolverhampton. And the frustration was we went from a club, potentially, that could have got promoted to a club that our season fizzled out in the end. And that was because we lost two key players within that. And that's the, the frustrations of a, a manager. Yeah, so it could be certainly a tough month in January, but it could also make your season. Stephen, thank you very much. Thank now. You. You're back at the desk. That's me done. <laughs> Stephen, you're mentioning some of the, the frustrations, the difficulties yes. there. How difficult is it to balance everything in these transfer windows in terms of the needs of your squad, the players' needs, players being injured perhaps, agents, uh, and the timescale of it all, I guess? Yeah, it's very difficult. And I think as well that, that clubs will only allow their players out to other clubs that will not affect them directly. So there's quite a lot of strategy within that. You know, a lot of the time as a manager, you want to support and help your players that are not playing and get them moved on so they can further their career. But it's a time where clubs around you can affect you. If you're going for promotion, you don't want to put your players to potential promotion rivals. 
or if you're fighting relegation, you don't want the players to, to be able to affect that as well. So there's a lot of strategy in it. And, uh, you know, it's a difficult period. And, you know, as I've said, each manager, each club has to overcome, you know, certainly different types of, of difficulties. How different is it to, um, as a manager to deal with transfers in the January transfer window compared to that in the summer? Well, it depends again on the club. You know, the bigger the club, the more organised the club, you know, they, they, they have a lot more things put in place. And of course, certain things can affect that, as we're seeing with Manchester United, where you get a, an injury that's come out of the blue and you have to then re address that uh, short term. But for managers like myself that are working in the, the lower leagues, like uh, Carlisle, for example, we had absolutely no recruitment structure. That was something that with the sale of Jared Branthwaite that I wanted to invest in, you know, to build that part of the club. Because in the summer, we had to take in 16 players, which is a huge task when you actually don't have a process in place to do that. So it becomes much easier for the managers at the top level because a lot of these tasks are being done by the recruitment department and you only need to see the final parts of it. But for the managers at the bottom end of the game without that resource, so much of your time in January can be taken up by having to, as I said, watch the likes of Y Scout, you know, watch players' videos, all of these things. So it's a really demanding period. You know, there's times for a manager where you're working till one, two in the morning and then up again, ready to go. So it's a, a, it's a really difficult and demanding period. I mean, I was going to pick up and ask you just how hard it is as a lower league manager to attract players when you don't have the finances, but you're saying it's probably actually harder not having the resources like a scouting network and all of that that these Premier League clubs crucial. have. Absolutely. These are crucial aspects of it because these allow you to plan ahead of the game. You know, so these are things that uh, you have to get in place if you're serious about, you know, moving your club on to the, the next levels. Yeah, and Stephen, just before you go, we are quickly running out of time. But what's next for you? What does the future hold? Are you keen to get back into management? <laughs> I'm keen to get back into yeah. football, of course. You know, I love it. You know, I, I'm so passionate about the game. You know, I'm very open-minded. Sometimes you get pigeonholed and people think you're only a manager. But as I've demonstrated in the past, I've been the assistant coach at, uh, at Scotland national team. I've worked with the national team on analysis. Um, I've been very open-minded, I've managed in Cyprus, I've managed in Scotland, England, so I'm very flexible. So what next for me, I don't know, but very open-minded. Crucially, where do you and James Madison get your hair cut? <laughs> no, I don't That's get my hair cut. No, my son gets my hair oh, cut. Right, right, okay. <laughs> but no, not, not me, you know. <laughs> Stephen, it's been a pleasure uh, having you on Transfer Talk. I have no doubt that you will be back working very, very thank soon you. indeed. But thank you so much for your insight. Uh, uh, we will be back tomorrow, of course. Uh, my thanks to Keith, to Michael, who you saw disappear earlier on, James, and to Emma as well. But please do join us again. Good Morning Transfers returns at 9 o'clock in the morning. And then, of course, Transfer Talk will be back again. That is from midday tomorrow. You can check out all the episodes as well over on our YouTube channel, the Sky Sports YouTube channel, for all our previous episodes. And then don't forget tonight, tune back into Sky Sports News at 7 o'clock. Dharma Chef and Kavi Solokol returning with the Transfer Show, as I said, at 7 o'clock. Lots of you getting in touch using that hashtag transfer. So lots of Manchester United fans just wanting to see that Bruno Fernandes deal done. Uh, ben, Ahmed uh, just saying, when is it going to happen? Hopefully we will be able to bring you some news of that uh, in tomorrow's episode. But yeah, maybe don't hold your breath. Stay with us on Sky Sports News. A live news conference with Pep Guardiola is coming your way very shortly.